Hello, welcome to another episode of On the Waterfront here on Sparks 1524. I'm Nathaniel Miller. Once again, I'm going to whisk you back to my early days in the Navy when I was stationed at Fleet Air Reconnaissance Squadron 2, or VQ-2, for deployed to Rota, Spain. Uh, I was a yeoman, an, an admin clerk, didn't know what else to do, so that's how I started out because everywhere's got admin. And it did work, so I did find my career path eventually. Now, VQ-2 flew the EP-3 Ares-2 aircraft for reconnaissance. This was a variant of the P-3 Orion that most people are familiar with as a submarine hunter. And in fact, uh, the Q, as we called it, our air crew flew the P-3s for training purposes to keep their hours up and uh, just train on, keep, you know, keep familiar with the airframe. So that way the EP-3s could be specifically used for missions. Because you only have a few EP-3s, they're big, expensive airplanes. I got to Road to Spain in April of 98, and of course that meant my first Christmas was... December of 1998. This was my first Christmas overseas. It was awesome. And I still to this day love the big Felice Navidad sign that Rhoda put over the roundabout near the base. But in world events, the Kosovo uh, Albanians had revolted against Serbian oppression in Yugoslavia, sparking the Kosovo War. Originally, NATO was simply monitoring this. And our air crew were flying over, both from Rhoda and mainly from our four deployed our forward debt site in Suda Bay, Crete. It wasn't a big deal in that we were just monitoring and keeping an eye on the situation, but we also knew that there was a real risk. I mean, come on, we're, our air crew are flying over a combat zone. It wasn't hard to imagine one of those combatants looking up and deciding they didn't like a NATO aircraft fly, uh, flying overhead and <laughs> taking a shot. So it wasn't anything to sneeze at, laugh at, or take lightly, but it also wasn't anything to panic over. Move on into 1999, and two things happened. One, I was in a motorcycle wreck, and two, NATO started bombing. And by the way, those were not related. So NATO began bombing Serbian forces when it became clear that there was a genocide by the Serbians against the Kosovo Albanians. At this point, of course, now our air crew are going into combat. Those of us on the ground as ground pounders, we're now doing what's called combat operations because we're directly supporting we're, we are war fighters who are now directly supporting the war fighters that are getting shot at. Those of us doing combat operations are still in a high-stress environment, partly because people we know, my enlisted buddies on the air crew side and officers who I worked for and had a great deal, and most of them I still have a great deal of respect for to this day, are going to get shot at. But it was our job, and we were supporting an effort to stop a genocide. Now, in March 99, I had been in a motorcycle wreck. Some Yahoo in Rota pulled out in front of me in a roundabout, and I had to dump the bike. So I'm sitting there back at VQ2, pin sticking out of this hand, trussed up in a sling, doing everything one-handed. Try to be an admin clerk typing one-handed. Oh, my Lord. Because VQ2 was on the flight line already, our hangar was there, we volunteered to take donations for the Kosovo refugees. Uh, our public affairs specialist at the time, the yeoman who ran that office, was actually downrange in Crete. I was shortly to take over the public affairs office, but I wasn't there yet. But because I was one-handed and we had a newfangled Kodak DC-50 or DC-20, but it was an oblong, rectangular-shaped digital camera that I could handle one-handed, I was mainly taking photos of our people sorting all these donations from American personnel on base. I only have a few photos because... I just kept a few for my own diary, so I don't have a whole lot to show you. What struck me was how much crap we had to sort through. One-third of what we sorted actually was useful. Two-thirds was nothing but junk. Some of the things that caught my eye early and made me stop and think were things like some very expensive fur coats and very expensive men's trench coats. And my first thought was, who the hell is going to, what the hell are they thinking donating a fur coat? Wait a minute, hang on. These are refugees in a Central European winter. Who gives a damn if it's a thousand dollar fur coat? It's a coat. It'll keep somebody warm and maybe alive. There's some very nice men's leather shoes that were donated. Again, though, it was a shoe. It was intact. It was clean. It would clearly protect somebody's feet. So these items were useful. A lot of toys were useful. May have been a little broken, a little chipped here, cracked there. You know, they were used, but they were well cared for, so they would definitely be valued by refugee children. That was about one-third of what we sorted. One-third. Two-thirds of what we sorted was crap. Just crap. 
I don't know who in their right minds thinks that donating a slinky black cocktail dress to refugees in the middle of a European winter was appropriate. Who thought that stained and torn gym clothes, shorts and tank tops was appropriate for a Central European winter, much less what person in need with any self-respect would actually appreciate being handed a pair of gym shorts that's stained, ripped, and the waistband is so stretched out they're not going to stay up on your hips. A lot of people we discovered on that base were virtue signaling fools. These were people who were more concerned with, one, their own convenience, because, oh, it's an excuse to clean my closet out and get rid of that junk. And also their self-image, because now they can boast, oh, I donated all of this stuff. How great am I? In my opinion, that is a dick move. And I use that word intentionally. Those kind of people are virtue signaling fools. They're no better than the politicians and celebrities who tell us to eat insects and get rid of our cars while they jet around on private jets telling us how to live while not living that same way. These people were no different and no better. And it disturbed me back then. It still disturbs me to this day. These people that donated things like the slinky black cocktail dress, toys that were shattered and broken apart and couldn't be used by anybody. Clothing that might be intact but is stained and dirty and just you, it's more fit to be used as a rag. It was, like I said, it was disturbing. Two-thirds of that crap we just had to throw away after we spent days sorting it. And that brings me to December of this year or December of any year. This is a time of year when many human traditions coincide. For Christians such as myself, it's the time we mark and commemorate the birth of Jesus Christ, whom is our Lord and Savior. Muslims spend the month observing Ramadan, a very holy month that involves fasting, prayer, reflection, and community, which includes community service. Uh, our Jewish brethren observe Hanukkah, which commemorates the retaking of Jerusalem and the miracle of the oil from the 2nd century BCE. Pagan and Celtic peoples observe the winter solstice. And, there, and, and on and on, go around the whole planet. Human culture, every human culture has some kind of festival this time of year. And almost all of them focus on, among other things, charitable giving. The point of charitable giving is not to make us feel better about ourselves. Ooh, how great am I? I got rid of all that stuff in my closet. Well, if the stuff in my closet is junk and not fit to be used, why the hell am I giving it to somebody? That does nothing for them. Makes, maybe makes me look good, but who the hell cares if I look good if what I gave is useless? Be mindful this time of year about what you give. Now, I love supporting thrift stores, partly because it is a simple way for me to take items that I'm never going to use again, but that are useful. They're clean, they're in decent condition, and they're useful, and give it to an organization that can sell it and get a good price. It's December. If I have gym clothes that are clean, that are in good shape, yes, I could donate those to a thrift store. They may not sell them this time of year, but they can sell them in the spring and get a good price. So thrift stores are a great way to donate a lot of items at once as long as those items are in good condition. But if you're supporting a charity that's helping people on the street directly, why are you going to give broken toys? Why would anyone give a slinky black cocktail dress? People on the street need coats, shoes, pants, and shirts that fit and are clean and intact. Children on the street need food. If they have toys, they need toys that are intact, clean. Charitable giving is about looking outside of ourselves to see the need that's actually there and not something that satisfies our own convenience. I said I've never forgotten that lesson from living it back in 1999. And that is what, and for years, that has been in the back of my head here as Chris Kringle's critically cautionary Christmas carol. This is a time of year to celebrate. It's time of year to mark the end of the year, see where we've come, where we hope to go. Hopefully, we can spend time with family and friends, at least a little bit. And it's a time to get our eyes off ourselves and remind ourselves to look outward and see the needs that are actually there. Don't let charitable giving, especially this time of year, but all through the year, don't let it be an excuse to get rid of crap. 
take some time to think it through. See the needs that are actually there. And even if you're like me and you love supporting thrift stores, just remember that what you give needs to be clean, intact, worthy of use again. None of us can ever meet somebody else's need perfectly because we're human. But most people appreciate our efforts if those efforts are respectful, courteous, and practical. So engage in a little practicality this holiday season. Be aware of what you give and to whom you give it. Be respectful and see the need that's actually there. This is not a time for our convenience. It's a time for us to see other people and meet them where they are. Well, I look forward to hearing your comments. If you have any, please leave some here, or if you want, you can leave them on my written blog, which is linked down below. Uh, I would also ask you to hit that subscribe button. That does help out my channel a little bit by at least getting it up a little higher in the algorithm so maybe more people will see it. I appreciate your time. I do hope that whatever your tradition is, you have a great holiday season. Uh, and to my fellow Christians, I will say specifically, Merry Christmas. May the peace of this year rest upon you and your loved ones. Until next time here on Sparks 1524. I'm Nathaniel Miller, and remember, go and do great things.